Hey, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I am Tom. And uh, first of all, if you haven't already, you can go to my website at tomrayswebsite.com, follow the show. You can listen to other episodes of the podcast. Plus, I do a daily webcomic where it's autobiographical. It's about something that happens to me every single day, and it's called Then This Happened. I put that out every day. Plus, I sell things like this, pop culture and retro games and illustrated books, and I also do videos on the YouTube channel about them, about selling them, finding them, and using them to support my art career. So you can check that all out at TomRay'sWebsite.com a name that I took because TomRay.com is already taken. Anyway, on today's episode, I talked to an artist who lives on the East Coast by the name of Linda Edwards. And Linda actually has a fascinating backstory, and she tells me all about the history of her family, which involves the sleeper sofa. There's all kinds of interesting stuff that she has to say, and we also talk about her artwork and how she started her own art school that now has moved to teaching online called Art and Asanas. So here's my interview with Linda Edwards, starting right now. Linda Edwards and I'm a freelance artist. I've been a freelance artist but now I've started an art school in my community and we have been growing prior to the pandemic uh, doing paint sip parties and just um, cultivating creativity and getting people to think about art in a different way in a fun way and just uh, trying to get that out there. I'm at a, I, I'm at a transitional goal in my life. Uh, I'm 52, so I've been doing this a long time. So right now I'm like, I have a partner that I'm mentoring, so I want her to learn about the tutorial aspect of art as well as the business side. And then for me personally, I'm just kind of going back to my roots. I'm at a mentoring goal in my life. Okay. I want to... I want to like help people say, see that there's business and art and you can have, as long as you can adapt and grow and learn tech and learn whatever is out there, learn your target audience, you can have a business in it and it can be fruitful. And you had How's said, that? that's good. And you had said that uh, <laughs> uh, you work in, a, you started an art thing in your community and that community for everyone, like you're yeah. located where? I'm in Ringwood, New Jersey. Okay. So it's a, uh, right now, it's a very small community. It's 30 miles outside of New York City. We're just trying to create that, like you, because I was kind of watching what you do, incorporate all aspects of art, mm -hmm. whether it's music, visual, cultural, written. Uh, the same thing that we're trying to get going on in our community as well. Yeah. And you had been doing it for 30 years. How did you get started? Oh, uh, well, I was fortunate that my parents were very, they were art oriented. My father okay. came from a, my parents were 20 years apart, to be fair. Really? So I, Yeah, and I'm biracial. My name is very deceiving. I have a very waspy the last married name, but <laughs> I come from a, a an eclectic background at a time period that it wasn't uh, appreciated or accepted. So I, my mother came from Puerto Rico and was a dancer during the uh, late 60s for Tito Puentes, and she was what you would call the hawker. Wait, and with Tito Sally Puentes? Did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. continue. So, you, so <laughs> I know. she used to dance for the Metropole um, dance and be a belly dancer to help people come in and see what jazz fusion was. Okay. And then my dad was 20 years older and an architect, and his background was uh, mainly his family were first generation Jews from England, Ireland, and Russia. 
and they came to the United States and they invented the sofa bed and the recliner. What? So, yeah, <laughs> I know. I have the patents okay. to prove it, but so that's the background. And I came into conception at a time period that it was not acceptable to be biracial. Two religions. My father was Jewish. My maiden name is Glick. Uh, I can tell you all the things that I was teased about in Catholic school okay. <laughs> that rhymes with Glick. <laughs> that's another story. Oh, no. But just to let you know, that's how it led to running fast, learning about diversity, and incorporating um, how I learned to adapt in art, in every aspect of art, and yeah. grow. And can I just say, so the sofa bed thing, I used to be a delivery driver, or not a delivery, uh, one of the people that worked on the trucks for St. Vincent de Paul. And oh, okay. yeah, I... Uh, did not like carrying or when we got donated those things. They are the worst thing in the world they are to the move. <laughs> but if you think about after the depression, that was the oh, thing yeah. to have. You didn't have a lot of room. So a recliner and a sofa bed yeah. made the best of your small, tiny space. I agree. And the concept a, of them they, are great. I just don't yeah, want to move exactly. one ever again. <laughs> no, me neither. I don't even have one in my house. Okay. I used to tease my father like, I'm so glad you stole the patent. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So now in school, so you were, you said you were in a Catholic school, but were you taking art there or did you go to college for it? Like what was the progression for you? No, the progression was, um, well, I was born in Puerto Rico by um, uh, parents that were not accepted by the norm, 20 years apart. My father was Jewish for in the World War, was a signal intelligence, came from a design background, first generation American. And then my mom, was a soap opera star back in the 60s and a dancer for Tito Pointers. But when we were kids, she became a soap opera sensation. So the two of them were kind of like this little dynamic duo in the early 70s okay. in Puerto Rico. So he created the El Conquistador Hotel, the inventor of the uh, kind of the tram that they have in the El Conquistador where uh, yachts could park mm -hmm. and then take the tram to the casino and then my mom was a, uh, an actress and a dancer and was a local so i had that two the two dynamics that inspired the way that my sister and i grew in our arts yeah and where we are today yeah and what kind of art did you start out making like what were some of your first influences Honestly, uh, my first influences in the art field was dance. I came from a dance background. Okay. Um, I was uh, the first born from his second marriage and my mom's first marriage. So I was the kind of like the, I was premature. So I had a lot of health issues. Mm -hmm. But because of that, my father used to take me swimming all the time. And then my mom was forcing the dance to add pigeon toes and crooked eyes and dealing with that and it was his second round of having children so he was much more patient in the 20 year difference mm -hmm. he would be the guy that would wake me up take me swimming in the morning or as I went to school take me swimming after school worked in the industry because he was an architect and a designer uh, back in Puerto Rico so I lived my life in the office with my father, okay. with daddy's girl. Uh -huh. It was either in the ocean swimming or with my mom taking dance lessons okay. in ballet and then uh, learning the industry. So my entire life was molded into mechanical drawing and architectural, ar architectural drawing. Yeah. Um, but also dance. So my mom pushed me and we moved so often after the age of seven because of my dad's work he was his historical architectural designer so he did a lot of historical restoration so everywhere that we moved was because of the job that he had mm -hmm. and 
it led to history, which led my passion into history and learning about indigenous cultures. And so even though I started off in dance, I had medical issues that warded me off from progressing. I got to a point where actually I was a student of Twyla Tharp when I was 16 years old, okay. got to that point, but ended up with hip problems. And then my father was like, okay, what are you going to do next? I know dance was your first love. You grow in something in the arts, you know, but I didn't really get into painting till I was 10 as a fluke. My mom bought me a paint set. I hmm. copied a Christmas card and she was like over the moon. She's one of the good <laughs> fans. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> to a fault. To a fault, you know. Yeah. Like, you're going to be a star. Um, but I did accomplish a point in my teen years where I was semi-professional, but then it got to a physical level. And that's kind of what led me into combining the two. How so? Modalities. Uh, because of my own personal experience of having to rehabilitate my own self and my father helping that, mm -hmm. he fought. So a little background about my dad was he fought in World War II. He was in signal intelligence, was shot, shot down, but he was a student of Joseph Pilates. Because oh. that's when, yeah, so that's when they incorporated the modality for soldiers and experimented but that is rehabilitation was during World War II. Okay. That being said, growing up, I was the uh, third of his children, but being an older parent, dad was old enough to be my own grandpa, Right. was he learned all these rehabilitative modalities and incorporated in our daily life. And it, being the first one that he had to deal with as a child that had extra uh needs mm -hmm. um he was the one that was pinnacle in my uh upbringing as far as historical aspects of documenting the artistic aspects of life mm -hmm. your personal experience some people write that was my visual diary it wasn't until i couldn't do it anymore as a team that I, he posed the question of like, okay, you've been trained this way. What are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. um, and my mom was the, always the entrepreneur, even though she was a dancer, soap opera star in her realm, she was always the one that really gave me the confidence and always said, regardless of what experience I had, as far as being picked on in school for being different or um, a simulation, she always was the one to say, okay, you could, you got it. You're strong. You could do the next step. You're going to be uh, great at whatever you do. And so I think the combination of my parents really uh, helped cultivate. Mm -hmm who I am today and my children and the people that I hope that I inspire. Yeah. And the <laughs> style that you have is, I mean, I see now the history in it that you're talking about, but it's also a little surreal. Like how did you find yeah. uh, the particular that way that you paint? That's a growth process. I yeah. mean, I went to art school. I moved out when I was young. I had, I had an aunt that had AIDS at a time in my high school background. My mom had to care of her sister. It was her sister. At a time where, kind of ironically, is what we're going through now, where people felt that, oh, you had AIDS, you were expendable. Right. And because of cultural diversity, I never felt uh, really that I fit in on either side of my cultures, but I learned a lot from the things that we experienced through our family background where we were ostracized so often everywhere that we moved that we learned to adapt. And I found solace in art, whether it was physical, kinetic, or visual. Mm -hmm. And learning the fact that also prompted me to learn about my background as well because I was the other category, I hate to use quotations, right. portraiture was really what 
made me connect and helped me connect with people because of moving so often. Um, I always had a great connection with people, but because I had to move so often, I would lose connection. And the only thing that I had in my own psychological well-being was to paint and draw. It was before the era of taking pictures with your iPhone. It was like <laughs> you had to, you had to use your memory, right? To like, oh, this pe this person really was important, and I, I have a, a physical recall, hmm. so to speak. I can forget people's names, but I don't forget faces. So I always had that as a solace and like my little comfort blanket. Yeah. When I had to learn to, okay, I can't dance anymore. What's the next phase? How can I adapt and evolve as a human being and be uh, productive? I like how you said in your I'm own. Sane. Well, I like how you said in your own small voice, and I'm looking, and I've seen your your work, and I'm looking at the pictures behind you. Uh, your work is nothing but sm it's other than small. You, you do gigantic, so I think it's interesting that you use the phrase in my own small voice, and it's like you make really large pictures. Uh, did you always did you always start out that way? Like were you, were yeah okay it, yeah I did. So I was the guys in the shop for my father. So <laughs> I always grew up in the office, and whenever he needed uh, somebody to do some like faux painting or recreate or copy something yeah. for his designs, because he did he dealt with corporate installations. And um, he did big jobs. He was a corporate designer for hotels and restaurants across the world, around the world. Okay. So he, the way he taught me was tactile. So I was a tactile learner. So he would say to me, okay, I want you to make this piece of wood look like marble or a frame for a picture and oh. gild it. And he would talk me through the process and learn it. And so that's how I learned from him. I was not. I was not a good student. In school, so <laughs> I was more visual, tactile learner. Okay. And he understood that, and that was that was the beauty of uh, the relationship with my parents. Even though they were twenty years apart, they each gave their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, whether my mom was listening to the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin, right? <laughs> you know, and then he was teaching me how to like oil, lift oils, and slide a canvas under it and do something like a Jackson Pollock, mm -hmm. you know, there was always this bohemian avant-garde eclectic uh, friendship that they both had whenever we left or mm -hmm. moved. So they did keep sustainable artistic friends that constantly inspired and were our mentors as children. Okay. And you said that you weren't good at school, but you've uh, you said that you're you've been teaching for thirty years. So how how do you go yeah. from not being good at school to then teaching? <laughs> ah, how does that happen? Great question. Great Thank question. you. <laughs> I love that. I actually relate better with children. Uh, it might explain a lot to my mentality. That's funny. Uh, I, I just I think kids just give that fresh and honest perspective mm -hmm. about life. You know, I remember being that kid trying to explain that to my mom because some things she didn't understand. I was always her translator. That was the other thing. There oh. was a language barrier. Okay. So even though my parents were 20 years apart, different cultures, I always had to translate for my mom as a young kid. So you could say, um, I'm kind of like that uh, social introvert. Uh -huh. I learned to be social because I had to translate for my mom, but internally I'm an introvert. I'm very shy. <laughs> really? But yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I get a lot of feedback from people and that's what inspires me. So I really enjoy now as an adult more so than I did when I was a kid. I did it out of uh, necessity when I was a child and now as an adult I crave it okay if that makes sense sure yeah yeah it's fuel to the fire right yeah and what was the reasoning behind teaching children or not even the reasoning what was the like how did you just suddenly decide that that's what you were gonna start doing 
That was a slow migration. It was an evolutionary process. Um, to be fair, I went was in the club scene for a long time after I went to art school. So I was involved in the LGBTQ community and raising money and getting the information out about AIDS back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like the fuel in the beginning. But now, as I got older and was married and became a mom and finally uh, grew roots in my neighborhood, that's really how it evolved. As a kid, I always was the Pied Piper. Wherever we moved, I would tell you know the parents, Oh, I'll take care of the kids so they could play and the kids would call me and because we always lived in buildings and there was always that was a demographic that I could relate to was like I could talk to kids. Okay. Um so I was always kind of a caregiver by nature. And through that it, it evolved wherever I moved. I was kind of gravitated to like making sure kids were safe kids were being well-rounded or mm -hmm. exposed to art or if they needed an out uh, being, uh, you know, just a situation. Maybe I should have gone into social work, but I don't think I have the tenacity or the bravery to keep that going. Mm -hmm. But that was the method of the, the ideology in my own head was always a, a, a relatability. Okay. How would you get the word out that you were doing such a thing? Because uh, you're doing it out of your own home, correct? Yeah. Okay. So my school is out of my own home. I've been here now in Ringwood for 30 years. I started off with my when I had my first child. Uh, I babysat as I moved and was transient growing up. But when I finally met my husband and moved to Ringwood, he was a great inspiration and I was that girl that was like, no, I'm not getting married. I'm not having kids. I'm mm -hmm. going to do my own thing. And then when I met him, you know, love takes a different turn. And um, I love the town. We used to come here as kids. I lived in an urban community in Passaic. So when I was a kid, I used to drive up here with my parents to drive in the country. And we used to have picnics. And I always loved it. And thought, oh, I'd love to live here and have something. It's so artistic. It's, there's so much history. Cooper Hewitt mm -hmm. was here, had his summer home. Um, it's 30 miles away from Manhattan. So it was far enough, but close enough to culture and being able to still stay relevant within my field. Mm -hmm. And I can do the work. And so what evolved with being involved with children was that I worked for the after school program and they trained me and I used to do art programs for the middle school kids out of one of the school and it kind of evolved I got the training and then that kind of evolved into um, going into physical uh, training because of the fact that I had my own rehab to do from a very young age and always grew up having to have rehab all the time it was a natural progression as far as my art was involved and growth as uh, a mom and a human being and a partner was well why don't I get my certifications about health kinetics and diet and help kids because I had a kid and art I mm -hmm. think it's all correlated, so to speak, you know, um, one tied to the other. You can't do massive paintings and big things and not work out or train those muscles to be able to withstand. <laughs> okay. As you know, as a cartoonist, you might be like hunched over oh, somewhere. Yeah. yeah, and you got to roll the shoulders back and look up to the sky and kind of stretch it out. Mm -hmm. I take a lot of pleasure in uh, inspiring people to be physical and yeah. not only physical, but artistic as well. Recently you, or actually, I don't know if it was recently, but I know on your Facebook page, you have been doing live uh, painting sessions outdoors. Yes, we were. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed at myself right now. Why? <laughs> There's a, as you know, it takes a lot of planning to do 
you know, even though it looks like I would, <laughs> you have it to does set up the lights, to set up the equipment, it's physical. It does you when you pay it. attention to it. Uh, it. Let's put it this yeah. way: the most amount of effort that I put into doing <laughs> video is when we were setting up to do this interview. It's probably the most that I. Most of the time, it's like I'm going to turn my phone on. I have an idea, and I should yeah, think yeah. it through, but I don't. So <laughs> you even, uh, well, and I see the umbrella behind, or uh, the parasol behind you. Uh, I know that you've, parasol. you've used that in it a lot. Like you'll start I the video by the blocking. I purple too. <laughs> so when did you decide to start doing those live, uh, those live video sessions, which I have, Actually, it, some of the people I've been talking to, they've, I've been noticing it more and more, which is a good thing. And I don't know if it's oh, because of awesome the. it's awesome to hear. Yeah. It's awesome to hear. We were doing it for free, Kate and I. And it started with the pandemic, just like we lost our clientele, we lost our students, everybody was kind of lost. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of said to her, let's just say every Wednesday we're going to do a little hour tutorial or an inspirational thing just to keep people out of their own heads and help them deal with this kind of problem. Right. Because we've never experienced this before. Anybody can say, oh, I've had this, I have this. But to empathize with everyone's experience, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's an arduous uh, task. So I didn't feel confident. I, I Not confident. I didn't feel it was right to charge at the moment when right. everything was happening like, hey, we're going to do Zoom classes. Mm -hmm. uh, you could pay this, that, and the other thing. Everyone was so confused and so lost, as well as uh, mostly the kids that we had on our class. So the only thing I can think of, what would it help alleviate the parents and the kids that are going through this that were involved within our own circle? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm glad that it expanded and I hope to do more. I want to do more. So I'm feeling a lot better. So Good. there will be more. Um, Kate's going to handle the Zoom classes. Uh, and uh, she's been a great partner and a help. I'm glad that I've been able to mentor more people to do the same thing. And just to give them another way of learning how to be uh, a productive artist, mm -hmm. working artist, because there's so many aspects. I've evolved so many times. I've, I'm 52, so I started in the early 90s. I grew up in it. I was fortunate. Mm -hmm. But there's not enough information taught out there of how to be uh, working artists, productive artists. How do you go with the time? Mm -hmm. How do you evolve? How do you keep up with technology? How do you keep up with uh, marketing? Mm -hmm. Marketing when I was a student was paper flyers. Right. You had to go hit the pavement, right? So the great thing I think now is the double-edged sword. It's great, but not great because I, I watched a documentary on Netflix that they're watching this, but the good thing is, as far as like an artist is concerned, is like, I don't have to hit the pavement. Right. Everyone that I've ever met is in my circle. So I can just say, hey, this is what we're doing. I can constantly remind you that we're doing this. We're going to do that. Um, what was the podcast? What was the documentary that you watched? Oh, the one on Netflix about um, social media and okay. how things are being uh, manipulated by algorithms, mm -hmm. which is true. Because yeah. a lot of the things that I do now by marketing myself, I don't pay for advertisement. So I do get blocked sometimes by social media and Facebook and Instagram. Um, how so? Because I do, well, because I do. But I've done uh, my magic on this aspect of it's old school. I joined a bunch of groups. I hit the pavement. I spend my hour a week on social media and just share content. I don't pay for ads. I do it all on my own. And I just 
engage my target audience or I just engage people mm-hmm. and not um, I'm not going to pay for advertisement. Okay. There's bigger fish that can afford it. I'm a small fish in mm-hmm. a very little pond. So I don't I tried it in the beginning and it never got me any business. So um, I learned a, a long time ago socializing and making friends and having conversations with people. Schmoozing, the art of schmoozing. <laughs> you said you got blocked. Were, were you considered uh, self-promoting in some of those groups? Is that what yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What so kind of stuff would you cool. say when you engage with people? You said you put up content. Like what kind of I content just, would you do? I would put up like, let's say if I did a portrait of a friend, this uh-huh. is what I did. But some groups will say, oh, you're promoting your artwork. Okay, that's fine. Huh. I'd rather uh, beg for forgiveness and ask permission. <laughs> right. But, well, so, what, it, what, were they art groups themselves or were you posting them in no, place? No. Oh, okay. It's, okay. All, it's all sorts of groups. Okay. I have, uh, I'm, I'm learning. I'm still Cause I was going to say what kind of art group would go like, how dare you post your art here? So I was, all right, oh, that no, makes more are, sense. There are some art groups. They just want you to post content, but don't want you to advertise that you're selling your content. Yeah. Which is okay. Kind of an oxymoron of like, well, it's an art group, but we're right. all starving. Yeah. <laughs> You yeah, know, like, a lot of it is the subtle trick too of just like yeah. you say something and sometimes people will go to your profile to learn more about you, which is kind of the way that Instagram works too. Like Instagram, yeah. I find it interesting that the only link you can use is in your uh bio information. Yeah. Which yeah. is a good and a bad thing. So you can't speci- unless you change your bio link, you can't specifically say in a post like just click here to go do it people have to make an effort which is that means they really want to know if they make the effort to actually go to your bio and look for the link so yeah, I, yeah. I i love and i hate that but uh i get yeah. it i get it and i think it's actually kept a lot of spamming out of it yeah no yeah. it hasn't no it hasn't <laughs> i know it's like it's kind of like you say it and then you learn it's like, yeah and it's like no i see spam stuff all the time yeah. <laughs> Like I always have this quandary, like I want to delete my personal page because I don't want to, I, I don't like posting personal stuff. I know it's a evil necessity, but I can't advertise through my business pages on Facebook. They won't let me do it unless I buy an ad. So the way, the only way I know to get around it, unless somebody has a tutorial to send me as a YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Is that I have to keep on personal page? Oh yes, and it goes. You have to verify that you're a real person. Yeah. yeah, I have to take the ad from my personal page and share it through my personal page. Yeah. So I have to take the business ad and then share it, and then people will be like, "Okay, it's accepted." Yeah. If I do it for my business, they put all these walls. So it's just learning those little nuances now. But it, yeah. yeah, and that's that's the there are ways around it and they're not good and you can actually get shut down. Like you can just create some random account that isn't connected to yours, but it's against their policies, but it's just the same as like with uh, Google advertising. I can go Mm -hmm. and create five different Google accounts right now that have nothing to do with, and I can never check them again. And then I can go off and start doing, uh, you know, uh, Google ads but the thing is too is that they're all they all have to be connected to an account that account is through a you know it has to be your personal account well and i'm even saying like the bank account or the credit card that you use to do it like it's there's no way to spoof all that either but they do want it connected to a personal account i guess it's a way to say that they're being protective making sure that there aren't bots or companies just creating fake profiles still happens yeah getting there (laughs) It still they need happens. To get there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what we, what are some of the things that you've uh, doing these live Facebook feeds? I mean, how how has it changed what you're doing, or how, what kind of benefits do you get from it? I know it's a lot of fun, but when oh. you're done, it's like you know, have you seen any changes or any uh, yeah, I have. outcomes? Yeah. What what kind? People are more engaged. People are craving it. There's so much uh, bad news out there yes. that the feedback has been so positive, more so than we ever anticipated. 
So we're kind of toying with going and doing our own YouTube tutorials. Oh, fun. Um, yeah, but we're still learning, you know, Pete and I, uh, that's our next step. We still want to contribute to the community, so we just um, uh, are doing a wine and paint plein air oh. sit party in October at our local Tree Tavern restaurant. So that's our first, now that things are clearing up a little bit, social distancing, mm -hmm. um, hoping to meet more uh, professional artists, so we're leaving it open to professionals and novices and that we will you know give them you know we'll have a certain price to give them the supplies that they can participate in oh you'd be bringing also... the supplies oh yeah yeah okay so do... before the pandemic we did paint and sit parties we would bring supplies we would do parties um, besides teaching the local community about regular painting. We're very diverse in what we do. Um, and we try to keep it fresh. I'm always affiliated with a group of people that are artistic. So for example, like my friend Amy, she lives across the street, Amy Roth Photos. She's the one that gave me the name for Art in Asanas. Yeah? She helped me start the business. How did, She's a product how did she give you that photo. name? It was kind of like we walk every day. It was one of those, like, we walk every day, we're shooting ideas. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I want to start something, but I don't know what the name is. She's like, oh, how about art and songs? I was like, I like that. Because I was a trainer and I used to teach yoga and uh, kickboxing. and uh, Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I've evolved with my art as far as involving kinetics with rehab and the things that I used to do with my kids as well as being a trainer. So I was like, oh, so I deal with all sorts of children in our house school. So we have like a kickboxing bag. Sometimes kids need to run around. Sometimes they need to kick a bag or lift weights or run around to get their inspiration just like I feel sometimes. Right. Sometimes you need to get that nervous energy out. Uh, Shake out the silliness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my family has a pet name for me. They call me the squirrel because my attention span is like, oh, look, oh, oh, right. oh, I want to try that. I want to do that. I want to do that. Um, so we implement that same modality. And then um, it was fun to like see what was going on in our local community. So we, I love entertaining. Oh. And my parents taught me that. Okay. And that's how I love meeting new people. Even though I'm an introverted, outgoing person, Okay. that still fuels my fire. Like a lot of what I paint has to do with the experiences that I've had in life whether it was someone that I was collaborating with, like my friend uh, Renee Masumi, and she's a latex fashion designer. Mm -hmm. So back in, uh, you know, before all this happened, I would model for her. And she's I'm like, you want a 50 something model? <laughs> but because I was invited and incorporated into these different communities for the LGBT and kink and I met so many people and the fact that I met all these interesting people is what really fuels my inspiration for my own personal art and the surrealistic aspect of what I do. So everything that I paint is from memory, is from my experiences, people that I've met uh, and made an impact or just tinselated my uh, fire for no knowing how humanity evolves. Also, as an artist, what would you say is one of the, uh, what are some of the most difficult things that you have to deal with right now? Uh, being a parent. Yeah. Um, because I've been involved in the kink community and the LGBT community, and as a parent, uh, I don't find it as difficulty. I find it as a plus because I feel that my parent, my kids are well-rounded and well 
informed okay. about how life really works. It's not black and white as we're seeing so much now. Um, I saw this happen during AIDS. I mm-hmm. had to deal with it personally. I had an aunt uh, from a different ethnic background at a time where people thought that the dispensable people were drug addicts, prostitutes, and gay people. Mm-hmm. And that was, they didn't really come to the aid until it was people of affluence. And it's kind of happening again. Yeah. I hate to say it. Right. I've seen it before, and they're learning the lesson the hard way. I grew up at a time period because of my diversity and my difference. Um, I was shunned. I went to Catholic school, moved a lot. But because of having a Jewish last name, I always had to explain and run fast. I was Mm -hmm. always in a fight. I always had to explain who I was and where I came from. And having to explain that to my kids now is, uh, it's heartbreaking because I didn't think that would be happening again. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the future, I, I love the fact that we have tech. I think the positive is that we have tech. It might be a negative for some, But the positive aspect of tech that I didn't have growing up was that information got around so much faster. And you can get a call to arms and have people that commiserated Mm. and understood where you were coming from, where when I was a kid, I felt really alone. So art really was my solace. And I like the fact now that no one's alone you can make a difference and the information is going around a lot faster and maybe there's some in misinformation but it could be corrected mm-hmm. even faster than it used to be it to be corrected this is a weird transition but i also this is one of the questions i like to ask while i wrap things up just cuz i get to <laughs> learn something about about the person i'm talking to do you have any uh, current obsessions uh that you have right oh. now in what regards? In what regards? In any like, regards, uh, like tools? anything. Like I, I'd love to hear like what kind of strange, like like me. It's the collecting toys and stuff. Like you know, it's uh-huh. like what are your obsessions? Like what's what's something that right now you're going when I pop onto YouTube or something like this is what I look at, or when I go out in when I finally get a chance to go out in the world, this is what I look for or what I want to do. Like what what are some current obsessions that you have right now? You're going to laugh at me. No, no. <laughs> or maybe if it's really good. <laughs> Camping's been my obsession lately. Oh, oh really? Camping. Okay. Yeah. Camping. I was a Girl Scout, a late Girl Scout, so I was CIT. So I loved camping. It was the one thing that everywhere I moved, I was able to be a Girl Scout mm-hmm. um, and be able to be in touch with nature. So that to me is my new obsession is teaching that to my youngest right now. He's 18. Okay. And uh, my oldest is engaged, but just enticing people to get out there, shut the tech off, mm-hmm. and really listen to nature and bring a little sketchbook, bring yeah. a little bit of music, just be and enjoy yourself. Right. And if you're lucky, they can turn the tech off because there's no reception. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> listen to the wind, listen to the wind and the birds chirping. And I, this is my favorite time of year. I hear the wind blowing and it, there's a rhythm in the earth right now when the wind blows and the light shines and you find that right time of the day that you hear some birds and something magical happens that you really didn't anticipate. Maybe it's like, you know, for example, I got a couple of funny examples. My dog loves camping. We went on a main trip, so he was so spoiled that uh, we took him everywhere okay. in the car to the point now we're home. He's ran off twice as <laughs> me. He got a taste for it. <laughs> he, yeah, he made it. He got a taste for it to the point where he got on Facebook twice 
lost dog anybody can claim. Oh, no. It. And he was just like a happy shit, little shit brick in a car, like, oh, I'm going. Some family's going to take me out because you guys neglected to because oh, we've been home because I've been still doing laundry from our camping trip. <laughs> oh, funny. So, like, he's run off. He's been my constant entertainment. And the other inspiration is that my son is evolving into an amazing human being and being so self-aware about not only because I think our youth are so bombarded with the uh, the atrocities of what's going on in our uh, politics and news that uh, he's actually appreciating the little things. We got a little family rabbit yeah. oh, going really? on over there, the squirrels and the birds and the flowers are blooming. So, wow. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm happy for that. Well, good. The little things. See, I didn't Focus laugh at that. That was, that was a good one. <laughs> I mean, I laughed with you, especially about the dog part, because that was funny. He's a character. And uh, is, where can people go to check out some of your work? Where, where would you like people to uh, direct themselves to see more of what you do and learn more about you? So, Linda with a Y, Linda Edwards uh, Art dot com on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. We also are Art and Asana's website is up and running um, and we are starting to do our Zoom classes soon. We're happy about that. We're helping people in our community. We're still doing our ph philosophical uh, stuff, but we, we're trying to get back into, you know, getting our little small business going and teaching the kids and the local community to, you know, decompress. Yeah. Uh, so that you can find us on Art Nisanas dot com on instagram and facebook and we have a website for that and i have to plug in my partner kate leo she's amazing kate with a k kate leo designs she's on facebook and instagram she's also known as artist painter creator um and she's been the pinnacle aspect of uh our business and we've been growing together and that's been actually one of the best parts inspiring her and my kids and the kids that we used to take care of and teach and the community and keep that aspect going. <laughs> That's awesome. And I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm so glad that I got a chance to meet you. Oh, it was nice to meet you too, Tom. I was so excited to like have this opportunity. Thank you.